Hey people, how are you doing? Welcome to the Sports Therapy Association podcast. My name is Matt Phillips, creator of OneShotLive.com. And as always, this episode is being recorded live on a Tuesday, 8 o'clock on the Sports Therapy Association YouTube channel. Our focus this month is on the lower back. If you're a regular listener, you'll realize that over the last four or five months, we've been, or longer probably, we've been working our way up the body and we've got to the lower back. And in this episode, episode 140, we're going to be talking with Owen Lewis, who is the co-founder of Born to Move Education Providers. Some of you will already be familiar with Owen's great work and also that of his co-founder, James Earls, who's the author of Born to Walk, who has been on the show in previous episodes. Owen is going to be taking us through very shortly some of the common misconceptions in the causes and rehab of lower back pain, as well as highlighting some outdated narratives regarding the core. So we do have people joining us live in the live lounge. And if you do join us and I can bring your messages and questions up on the screen. For example, first in the house tonight was Becky Carroll. It says evening, everyone. Um, it's a great idea to come along if you can join us live eight o'clock on a Tuesday. You can network with other soft tissue therapists. You don't have to be a sports therapy association member, um, but it is a great chance to kind of meet maybe some of the regional reps and, and see whether the STA has got something to offer you. Nikki Mansfield says, Buenas tardes, mis amigos. Oh, very nice. It's Spanish there. It's how we roll here in the Sports Therapy Association. It's multilingual, totally. Um, everyone is accepted and on an even level playing field here. And Nikki says, I'm looking forward to having some of my core beliefs challenged. Puns as well. Look at that. We're not even three minutes in. Well, Nikki's always dropping the pun bombs. Fantastic. Good to see you, Nikki. Um, Lindsay Penn is here as well. Evening all. Sabrina Monaghan has joined us. Hi, everyone. And Tracy Taylor. And they're all coming through the door. So, yes, if you're listening to the podcast and you fancy joining us, like I say, Tuesdays, every Tuesday, we've done it for 140 weeks in a row now. Um, you're welcome to come along to the Sports Therapy Association YouTube channel and, and join us live and ask questions to our wonderful guests directly. There we go. Um, oh, I don't know if Erin Lewis can see this, but there's people filling up very quickly in the room here. This is going to be wonderful. Lindsay Keith is here as well. Gary Benson, founder of the STA, is here as well. There we go. Great to see such um, a lovely group of people already filling up the live lounge. Okay, I think I've left him down in the lobby for long enough. So without further ado, we will get part one of Focus on the Lower Back started. And in this episode, like I say, we're going to be talking to Owen Lewis of Born to Move. Hey, Owen, how are you doing? Hello, very well, thank you. Nice. That's I'm not sure if I don't want to make your head swell too much, but they seem to be flocking in tonight. You seem to have quite a group of um, fans coming in. I'll take all the credit I can. <laughs> I mean, poor well, but I should only take a little bit. <laughs> no, that's, that's very nice. No, you do. Honestly, come very recommended. Um, we have a list of a lot of the time the guests we have is because somebody has mentioned or been on your courses or maybe uh, they know um, the other half, your other half, as I'm sure he's referred to a lot of the time, James Earls. Um, co-founder of Born to Move. So no, I appreciate you giving up your time to come on the show. That's an absolute pleasure. And um, yeah, thank you for inviting me and um, for anyone else who also invited me, kind of, uh, then, uh, then thank you. And hopefully something comes out of my slightly addled brain having had a very busy day. So it feels like a very long week already. It's only Tuesday here in, in my clinic. Yeah, for those of you listening to the podcast, you can't see. Um, it looks almost like he's got one of those kind of Zoom backgrounds, but actually it's a living, working, living, breathing clinic behind him with the skeleton there and the posters and the books. And yeah, so I appreciate you um, uh, talking to us directly after full day in clinic. So born to move. Um, people who aren't aware of your background, I mean, you have worked with some of the great pioneers in their times. There's lots of information to bring up the website just in case people are interested and want to find some more information about you let's put that up full there yeah so if you go to borntomove.com you'll see a load of information about both Owen Lewis um, and um, his other half I'm going to stop saying his name because it's about Owen tonight but James Ells is there as well um, and it's really interesting information because literally you have both have spent time I think both of you but definitely yourself with Thomas Myers with Rod, uh, Robert Schleit, Diane Lee and, and others um, who in their time were just pioneers, particularly to do with fascia and introducing loads of new revolutionary ideas um, to soft tissue therapy. And then I want you to talk me through how that then later on down the line 
turned into Born to Move? Yes, um, it's been a, a funny old route. Um, you know, it's one of these routes where you think it's going on a relatively straight and even keel for, I don't know, 30 seconds, and then it diverges off and it comes back again. And it sounds like it's sort of all planned. Of course, it, it really isn't. Um, but I, I, you know, I was lucky enough to to meet to meet James um, as being, you know, one of um, a relatively small uh, group of us running around Europe teaching this thing called anatomy trains. Uh, so that was that was me for a four or five years, something like that. Um, and then for various reasons, we well, first of all, James decided to to part ways with anatomy trains, and I stayed you know, stayed with the Nazi trains. That was, that was fine for me for, for a little while. And then um, gradually I realized that the, the, the part of the story that I wanted to develop and that James had started to develop as well um, was a very functional movement part of the, part of the story, part of the explanation as to, as to what's going on. And anatomy trains wasn't really developing in the way that I would like myself to develop. So I turned around to James and said, well, well, what are you up to? And, um, and eventually we kind of had a, had a couple of coffees and a couple of uh, beers and we decided that maybe we could, we could hash something out together, uh, which was a, you know, absolute privilege to me. Uh, I had a huge amount of time for, for James, for his, um, incredible level of expertise, um, and understanding in that kind of humble way that, that, um, that he has, uh, so it's been a you know such a pleasure to to work with him um, and collaborate on this on this project of Born to Move, and it's a it's a collaboration that is developing uh, rather than developed. You know we're always tweaking it, we're always changing. We're trying to work with the with the research and the latest ideas, and also come up with with new innovative um, ways of looking at things uh, to keep up to date with things, not just to for the sake of change, but to really, you know, um, challenge some of those, you know, we, some, some of the preconceptions that we have um, based on past experience and past knowledge, which was a little, little ropey. So it's lovely the fact that, you know, part of this discussion is about kind of challenging or, or, or at least questioning for a moment or two some of those um, ideas and bias that we may have. Um, of course, we all have those bias, we all have those um, difficulties. And one of our strengths really is to reflect. And this is what hopefully I can offer and what we can offer in these sorts of um, situations that we can we can just pause for a moment in that from that very busy clinic moment where you've got someone in front of you and you're saying, what the hell do I do here? And we can just pause in these moments and reflect and say, well, actually, why did I do that? And, and really asking the why is, I think, uh, very much at the heart of a lot of what we're, what we're up to at Born to Move. Um, and, and a lot of the, you know, the, the courses and the workshops that we've developed, yes, they have a, you know, there is a syllabus, there is a, a core piece of, of understanding and, and skill set that we're going to offer. We're also offering it in a way, hopefully, that is open to expansion and change, and and we absolutely feed off the the group that we're that we're teaching to um, within those within those workshops. Wow, I mean, I'm just sitting here thinking that everyone is so. I'm I'm feeling so happy you're on the show tonight because it's. I mean, I knew about Born to Move um, through James before, and I've read stuff by yourself. But yeah, just listening to you here, this is this is everything which our industry kind of needs at the moment isn't it we were talking a little bit how we're both the way you've taught universities I teach and we know that the syllabi are a little bit dated and it's going to take I think you said it'd be about a generation or so for things to change so it's so important that people like yourself are out there who can help therapists fresh off the block as it were not intimidate them saying everything you've learned is rubbish which isn't true at all but just kind of tweak it gently and understand that there's going to be in order to evolve, there's probably going to be a moment of either sadness or frustration or fear, because we all go through it when, when our ideas are challenged, particularly if we spent like two grand for these ideas. But um, so, yeah, I'm really happy to hear what you said so far. 
if if you had to put born to move this is really mean i don't know why i'm doing it i think as you've impressed me so much so far i'm thinking i'm going to have to challenge this guy but if you had like an elevator pitch for born to move which means you've got about 30 seconds of what people will get from born to move what would that be <laughs> <gasps> yeah you're right because because what you're asking me is is can you sell this thing and i'm kind of going well no not really <laughs> um yeah, my sales pitch is, is notoriously poor, um, other than saying that, you know, what we're doing within that, that whole construct of Born to Move is, is multifaceted, it is individual focused, so it's clinic, clinically focused, and it's focused on the individual. Yeah, so we're not talking about, you know, set ways of doing things or anything like that, but we've got a very good, solid, principally based um, framework which is flexible for the individual and able um, to uh, accommodate many people um, in terms of therapists so um, so yeah and, and we have you know you know we can I can draw on the the skills and expertise of so many different people you, know, you mentioned some of the the giants of the you know, that I that I sit on their shoulders um, and I also sit alongside somebody who's, who's a giant in the field, I think, uh, as James Ells, uh, um, the Born to Walk course, which is a, a really great starting point for, for this, this whole uh, journey of exploration. It's great that you passed. Fantastic. Uh, really good. No, I'm very excited. Um, and I'm hoping people listen to podcasts. Honestly, we don't. One of the things about the STA is we're not selling courses ourselves, okay? Because we've we've talked about it in other episodes. It gets a bit dodgy where you've got a professional association who also happens to be selling CBD and making money out of it. It's something our industry doesn't really need. But credit where credit's due, and that's what we kind of try and do on the STA is is not everybody is going to need born to move courses. I mean, there's a whole load of courses there which can can help different people at different stages in their career. But honestly, hand on heart, if you're looking for something which is going to um, be evidence informed which is going to be gentle in the sense that they're not going to force you um, to believe a certain way of doing things like like Owen has said they're going to teach you to be critical to reflect um, to talk to each other and, and see what comes up so really great stuff mate I'm really pleased that you're on the show thank you in other words right okay enough um enough boosting his ego i think we've done enough of that now we're going to talk about lower back pain um and and yeah for, for those reasons i said it's really great you're on the show because there are quite a few misconceptions to do this um and this is for people listening um to the show as well there was there was an interesting or very useful particularly at the time of 2020 paper that came out um what a review really um, and it was BJSM. I'm going to bring it up in the screen so people uh, watching the live show can actually see what we're talking about here. So it's BJSM. It's called Back to Basics, an editorial, and it was 10 facts every person should know about back pain. OK, and we're going to go with lower back pain at the moment. Lower back pain seems to be used a lot in studies, particularly chronic or persistent lower back pain when where we're doing studies to try and understand a bit more about pain. There's some great names down there. If you're not familiar with them, then um, I suggest you get familiar with them. People like Peter O'Sullivan, um, Kieran O'Sullivan, not related, just happen to have that great surname. Mary Keith, you might have be familiar as well. Uh, Mary Keith um, has done some work as well, I think, in the Independent, along with the Sullivans. Um, so um, yes, yeah, some other and, and other names in there as well. But it, it's got ten facts, which is interesting. We're going to have a little look through them. Um, which I asked Owen, well, can we go through them and, and, and you can give your opinion on them and, and build on them if so. And that provides a really nice foundation for tonight. So Owen, just checking, you still okay with that? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Sorry, there was a pause. <laughs> and also, in, if you uh, do look up this uh, paper, I know a lot of you prefer images than writing, which is totally understandable. They do also offer um, a nice infographic, which sums up back facts. Um, it's something actually you might want to have in your clinic either. I know I had some printed out and it was something um, that I was giving out to people. But yeah, but um, we're going to use that as a framework because it really raises a lot of these ideas which you guys as clinicians should probably be thinking about. So that's what we're doing tonight. Let me get rid of that now. So, um, so Owen, yeah, do you want to start with number one? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Are you ready? Go on. If you sent me this today, <laughs> and I in the in between clients, I was like, oh my gosh, another research paper to read. So like 
Motivation. You know what? It's very gentle. It's, it's to stimulate thought. And a lot of the things I know you've either written about or commented on or have had it fed back to me in courses that you've talked about. So you may, I mean, it may last a minute. You might want to no, no. go a little it, into it. So. It, was, it was actually quite a relief when I kind of eventually opened up and went, opened it up and said, oh, OK, this is this is this one. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen before. Um, and it is it's it is easy reading. It, some research papers are not, and they're dry and boring and oral. This is not one of those. So absolutely, if you guys get a chance to to have a little skim through, um, do so. But also, I would certainly advocate having a look at Peter O'Sullivan's work. He's somebody who I think we all should know of. Um, and he, I think, one of the things that he he does within this within this paper, but also within a lot of his work, is that he elevates the um, understanding and the idea of, of the cognitive belief and the emotional part of the, what I call the three-part story. So the third part being the sensorial part of the story, and the other two being the cognitive and the emotional. And every story we hear from our, from our clients has those three component parts. And I think what Peter Sullivan and, and, and those other colleagues that you mentioned um, does so well here is that he really emphasizes the role or our role as coach and facilitator rather than kind of doer. Yeah. And number one on our list, therefore, within all of this, this has got a big overview rather than before we get to the details, is our job, primary job has to be to listen and it's listening which is a skill that i think is often undervalued yeah it's a clinical reasoning skill that without we, we are kind of lost yeah before we and and part of that listening skill is the is the what and the how of what's being said so not only the the details that we can write in our notes but how do they say that yeah, what what are we learning between you know, reading between the lines? Yeah, um, uh, and and you know within that um, context, context that um, sorry, my brain goes into things like Wittgenstein, the the nineteen um, thirties, nineteen forties philosopher who's very interested in the power of words um, and how words can really shape our reality. And we we sit here in a very powerful position as therapists. And, and understanding the power of the words and, and often, and this is part of what we're going to be talking about, I think, the prevalence for the catastrophization of conditions like lower back pain. Yeah, we mentioned lower back pain and it's all about, you know, no, it's not, but it can be all about the negative and it can be seen as really a catastrophic or a catastrophic event. And we've got to say, well, hold on a minute, Let, let's rewind that. And I think that's one of the things that, that Peter O'Sullivan does, does so well. Um, and it, it, what's lovely about this is that, of course, it, it um, reflects very much in terms of, of what we're doing uh, on the workshops that, that we're offering in terms of trying to enhance clinical reasoning skills. Um, so that's that's one of the reasons why I went. Oh, okay, goody. We we can we can definitely get into get into a lot of the the details of, of what's happening here, so we can really listen to to an individual story. Great stuff, and awesome. it is wonderful because because if you are on the evidence informed page, as it which basically just means you are aware of the research as well as what the client wants, as well as what you're seeing in clinic, and it's that whole kind of three three-legged three stall thing. It just doesn't mean you're just looking at the research. It's very much everything else as well. But you will come across these same names. You will come across Born to Move. You will come across the Sullivan's. You'll come across Mary Keith. You'll come across these kind of names will come up. Because a lot of people worry that if they move away from what they were taught on their certification, where they're in a safe room with 20 people, and it felt like everyone does that, that they're going to be alone. But actually, this whole thing opens up a door to a very nice other place where you won't be alone at all. So... Great. Leslie Campbell says um, in the live lounge, Stevie and I um, are off to Peter O'Sullivan's CFT course next week. Of course you are, Leslie. Of course you are. Fantastic. You have to um, come on the show, one of the uh, um, Ask Tim episodes, and tell us about that. It would be nice to hear what you thought of it, Leslie. 
Um, so yes, thanks. Um, th that, that's a great oversight to these 10 facts. Um, um, and I'm keen now to take you through them. So number one, persistent back pain can be scary, but it's rarely dangerous. Yeah. This is straight in there, isn't it? It's, yeah. It's vulnerable. It's like, okay, everybody, let's just calm down. That's kind of, to me, that's what he's saying. He's just saying, look, we know it hurts. We know it's real. Yeah, let's let's take that on board, but let's also downregulate the sympathetic nervous system. Let's let's calm this whole thing down. Let's slow this picture down. Yeah, um, you know. And, and again, so you'll hear philosophy in, in in a lot of what I'm saying because that's kind of why one of my loves. And to me, this is a a, a change of perspective. Saying yes, it hurts. But actually, life's meant to be crap. <laughs> life's meant to be difficult. It's meant to be challenging. That stoic philosophy is prevalent. But actually, it's only a lower back that hurts. It's only that little bit on the right-hand side that hurts. And then we start to sort of tease that out. We say, well, actually, how many joints in your body? Wow, lots. Okay. And how many are going right? Oh, well, actually, a lot. So a lot of things are going right. How's your shoulder? Well, that's fine. And we could, you know, spend all day, all the next day, all the next day, advocating, say, showing how many things are going right. Um, so I think that's part of part of what's happening within that um, that little statement. So that kind of let's let's calm down and let's use our voice and our language to keep that in a calmer place, because we know that you know a, a lot of the time the the serious lower back pain really isn't that serious. Um, we talk about imbalances. We're talking about issues in in life, perhaps, but we're not talking about um, anything that is um, life threatening um, most of the time. And if we are, then we're going to refer pretty pretty damn quick. Amazing, yeah, yeah. It's a great message to have. Uh, devil's advocate, and I have to be really because yeah. I mean we mentioned this a little bit beforehand. There is we talked about off air about this, and and I valued your time there as well. Depending what circles you move in. There's a little bit of a danger, isn't there, of we talk about biopsychosocial and people almost like forgetting the bio a little bit. And because imagine if, if somebody comes in and they've had back pain for three months and you start going on saying, oh, yeah, but there's nothing. Even just saying it's nothing serious could just shut down that therapeutic line straight away, couldn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. No, you've got to be very careful with, with the words that we use. So we take on that information and we, and we totally acknowledge um uh, that 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 is a painful area yeah they do feel that pain it is real yeah it's absolutely real and it's absolutely debilitating and it's stopping them doing whatever they love to do which is often the you know the reason they're coming in to see us um and we still need to say but actually there's a lot of people out there with you know disc bulges and no pain so the fact that somebody's telling you you've got a bulging disc is uncomfortable and we can help you to improve this. This is changeable. We, you know, this is, you know, often I'm saying to people, hey, this is what I do. You know, don't worry about it. This is what I do. We're, we're, you're in safe hands. You know, we've got that, that, that trust element. We need to build that very quickly, straight away and turn around to someone saying, it's not real, it's all in your head. You, you've completely lost them. You, you've no chance of, of gaining that trust. You've got to crawl, you know, somehow trawl it back, but man, don't go down that route, route if you if you can. Um, yeah, so um, trying to trying to hang on to that one is yeah, it's it, it's a trick, but it's part of it. I think the other part of it is is really hopefully really useful, really important, is to find out the when. Yeah, not only the how does it feel, but when when does it feel whatever it feels. So, I, you know, yesterday, that's all it was, I saw somebody who came in and she was telling me how her, her back hurt. And I thought, oh, great, I'm going on a podcast. I'll, I'll, um, I've got a story to tell. This is going to be a good one. It's going to be really complex. And of course, it wasn't. Um, and it was a story where she said, well, it hurts. My, my back hurts when I'm sitting down. And I go, okay. So I want to hear that story. So, so it's sitting, you're sitting down. Okay, so how long? Oh, you know, 10, 15 minutes. Okay. And where are you sitting? Oh, I'm sitting in my chair. 
Okay, and what are you doing? Oh, I'm watching telly. So where's the telly? And she says, oh, it's just over there. And she turns and faces the TV as though she was. Yeah? So I'm kind of going, huh, I wonder if that's a factor. So instead of me getting my hands in there and doing work and manipulation, I say, well, could you change the position of the TV? Could you? And she all oh, know, but I could change the chair. I go, okay, we'll do that. <laughs> so now she's a little bit more straight on. And then we have a discussion. Maybe you could get up in the advert breaks and move a little bit. And, you know, this is intervention. Very simple. You know, it didn't take me as many years of university to learn that as I went through. It's kind of common sense. But again, for me, it's that, it's that reflective moment. I've given that opportunity to tell for her to tell her story, for me to reflect and say, okay, change your lifestyle, just a little tweak, reposition the chair, let's see what happens. Um, and it, it, it can be as simple as that, and, and, and that deregulates everything. It just says, hey, look, that's all you need, or perhaps that's all you need, and then let's go from there. Excellent. And like you said, we have to realize that that, that person may come in and they've already had a bit of Dr. Google and they really are worried that it's this and that and, and then need an MRI and that probably they've read something or a friend had it or maybe their mother had it and ended up in a wheelchair, whatever that is. So there's a lot of layers to peel off, isn't there? I liked how you said on your courses that, you know, you focus on, on, on active listening and, and that sort of stuff and, and reflection when someone's talking on and just negating it straight away, repeat what they said, something as simple as that to help the story come out. That seems to be a really important part of CPD these days. Whatever you go on, it needs to be there, which has been missed out in the past. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, no, exciting. OK, well, look, let's go to number two. We could talk about that for point one for the rest of the time, but let's shift to number two and see. Some of the are, are, are connected, obviously. There's a there's a progression here. Number two on this particular back to basics, 10 facts every person should know about pain is getting older is not a cause of back pain. Great. So again, we have a, what we're presented with, with, with that is we have a cognitive belief. Yeah. So the individual believes that getting old means that I will have back pain. Now that's, that's a belief that potentially creates a barrier to change. As soon as you hear, see, smell, taste, whatever, you feel that barrier to change. You've got to change the barrier. You've got to You've got to start to overcome it before me as the practitioner, as the therapist, can move on. If they are certain that it's due to age and they cannot be challenged by that, you know, that's absolutely certain, I can't change it. I can't make a change to your tissue that will magically... No, you are absolutely convinced that it's down to aging. And I have to turn around and say, well, that's an interesting belief. What about, do you, you know, how old are you? Let's say, and they say, oh, well, I'm 70. I say, oh, that's interesting. And are all 70-year-olds, have they all got back pain? And is it all on the right-hand side when you're sitting down watching TV? <laughs> and I go, oh, well, uh, well, no. Oh, okay, so maybe it's not age alone. Yeah, I mean, yes, age is a factor, of course partly because of the aging process, also partly because of the, of the social aspect of aging. Yeah? We retire, we stop, we take care of ourselves, we don't move because I'm now old and I don't want to move because I might hurt myself. So we're into that catastrophization, we're into that fear model of movement. And if we're fearful of movement, we don't move. If we don't move, we get more, we're more likely to be um, in, in discomfort because we know movement is really, really good. There's a reason we call it Born to Move. I was going to say, yeah, great title. Yeah, yeah, Born to Move. But people do forget it, don't they? They get to 55, 60 and thinking, oh, no, I shouldn't be doing this now. And and it's, yeah. it's, it's in fact, you should be trying to move more. You should be regulating and go, right, I need to make sure I still am moving and doing this. Yeah. Or you get someone looking after you and doing it for you. No, you stay there, love. I'll get it for you. Kind of the doting son or daughter which has the best intent in the world but it's the last thing you need you need them to get up and go to the fridge and or make you a cup of tea you know it's that's very it. tricky but um yeah and and that's part of uh, you know that's part of the social part of the biopsychosocial aspect that that we need to 
challenge if that is becoming a barrier to to change um then then you know making that change is is important we've got a few messages here I was, sometimes i forget about the live lounge because because you guests just suck me in completely and i'm forgetting there's other people listening here so sarah fluitt has uh, commented here listen and acknowledge so true this is changeable i love that um, Gary Benson says, thank you for the comments, by the way. Gary Benson says, sometimes the perception of what we say is misinterpreted as he said it's all in my head, despite our best efforts to explain it. Great opportunity to develop communication skills. Yeah, definitely. There's some classic things to avoid, isn't there? But it's so difficult if we're not if we're not living that pain experience. We don't know through our own experience what that person could be interpreting and, and, and feeling. So yeah, great point, Gary. Uh, Becky Carroll says, this is where video consultations became so helpful being able to look into people's environments yeah great point Ricky. it really was it's lovely to think of a positive twist on COVID isn't it suddenly we're looking into people's homes and going look well you you know rather than having them say I turn this way to the to the TV you could see their setup you know and they can explain to you you know very interesting yeah great point Becky All right, Gary comes back saying just had some great feedback from a member who attended a born to walk workshop last weekend mentioned renewed enthusiasm and desire to learn more about helping people to feel and move better. There we go. What a, Owen's arms are just up in the air, like, well, there you go. There yeah. you go. If we could have that person writing a testimonial and email it to, <laughs> to us, that'd be great. I didn't pay, I paid them well, didn't I? Gosh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then Stevie Barr says, age is not barrier, fit through life. Very nice. I'm oh, sorry I gave you a West Country accent there, Stephen. I couldn't do Glasgow just like that. But yeah, definitely great stuff. Okay, lovely. Um, so let's have a look then. Um, here's an interesting one. Persistent pain or persistent back pain is rarely associated with serious tissue damage. Over to you, Owen. Okay. Yeah, and I, I think, I mean, again, it's, it's picking out kind of the words within the words a little bit, but yeah, this, this, this idea of, 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 um, of persistent is is very very key there um i think and yeah we have you know again it's it is that kind of you i think for me anyway it's using the research so one of the things of 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 me as the as the practitioner is very much like i said earlier as as coach or facilitator of of knowledge and understanding so i will um quite often send people um research articles now whether or not they actually read them or not, i don't know um but you know um if somebody's you know dead set on on keeping a neutral spine and, and never moving the spine and being very you know um, um set in that way i will um throw them the the research about the um uh, i'm trying to remember the guy's name um 2010 vers v-r-e-s anyway it talks about neutral spines being um, being able to be herniated um, um, it, within neutral. So that's that's a lovely one to if I can remember the um, link. Um, and the other one I quite often use is the the one where it just talks about how um, spinal damage. So that they've um, used on MRI scans to prove there is spinal damage on healthy pain-free subjects yeah and and using that research and saying to somebody look this is the research that is you know fundamentally proving what what we know now that actually tissue damage and pain are not um linked um that's not to say that that individual hasn't got tissue damage hasn't got problems i need to find out if that's true or false and i need to prove it to them um, not only with the research, so there's the kind of, you know, the white coat syndrome, the, the power of, of that that I could use um, carefully, but also I need to prove it to them, to their body pretty quickly. So I need to say, okay, how can I do that? Now, there's multiple ways. My way in there would be to say, well, what's the pain that you're in? You're in pain when you're um, well, let's let's stick with that example of that lady sitting and she's twisted. Right? She's sitting in a twisted position. I'm going to straight away say, well, actually, if I take you out of that position, out of that twist, what's the pain like, like now when you're sitting down? And she gets a 
you know, a different response. Now, it may be a pain response change, yeah, possibly, but not necessarily because we know that the, the, that, um, that the nervous system can take four to six weeks to, to um, kind of calm down away from the idea of pain. Or it could be that their function changes. So they feel freer, they can move better. So as she sits down into her chair, that sort of squatting type action, she can flow a little bit easier. Things are moving um, more gracefully. And, and most people will pick that up reasonably quickly if, when we you know, little little cues and ideas within that. So this is ways of which I can I can uh, prove to them that well hold on if that was an area of damaged tissue that function wouldn't have changed that quickly and I like, oh yeah. and now we now we've got a lovely hopefully a lovely um, um, conversation between myself and and my my um, my client, um, and, and we can say, "Well, that's that's curious," and, and go a little further and a little further, and, and and start to play within that. That's lovely, and I like the way. I mean, that's the skill, isn't it? Getting people to to start having confidence by getting them to move, mm. giving them the the using thinking of all the possibilities and getting them to perform a little movement which they initially said they couldn't do but you put it into a different context suddenly they do it and just having that eureka moment where eventually they go i've just sat down in a chair so i can squat and that and it's lovely isn't it and you just sit back and think great yeah this, this and, is really gonna help they're the moments that i want to get my big highlighter pen and <laughs> you know and, and i and i do i get like super super excited for them mm. so that they really hone it they really notice it it's so important that we can say that's a positive and you're moving and the movement is positive and they can really acknowledge that um, because that's going to give them that all important confidence to change that cycle of fear and avoidance towards confidence and movement. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's great. Because I guess the same thing that got them maybe so easily into fearing movement and and catastrophizing can be undone you can use the same mechanism by proving look what you've just done see how you've reached up that height now and lifted up this you know then you can start undoing but it's not going to happen well sometimes it might happen quicker than you think but it's still going to take visits and absolutely we've still got a job haven't we yeah it, yeah we still got a job don't we? <laughs> but the lovely thing of course is is when it's quick you know, when it's quick, and it can be super quick, it can be, you know, then we're talking kind of neural system, we're talking possibly myofascial is a little slower, but neural, if it's a neural kind of, um, or a motor control change, that can be super quick. And then you don't see them again, but of course, you see their friends and their relations and, mm -hmm. and you're playing business. So that helps. And, you know, ultimately, my job is not to see people, you know, I want to be lazy, I don't want to see anyone, I want to sit at home, read my book. Um, and if I have to see someone, I, I want to minimize the time I'm seeing them so I can maximize the time I'm seeing other people. That's nice. And that's something, again, which we've talked about on the show, because people worry about business models, the traditional thing. I remember when I was a younger therapist, I remember my boss saying to me or questioning me, like, why have you put them in for next week? Well, don't you know every patient needs to come at least six times? And I'm like, whoa, hold on. Ding, 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 ding. Maybe it's the socialist in me. I was thinking, well, how that's not fair. What if they only need to see me a couple of times? And it was like... Um, but then again, I went the other way and I was telling people to go away, thinking you're fine, not realizing that maybe they want to come and see me. Maybe they're quite happy to spend their money coming to see me just to reinforce it because they're not going to exercise by themselves. They're not going to do that movement again. They want, they need their hand held. So it's so interesting as a young therapist, you know, to get it right and not kind of swing too far. I think as long as we're open we're within, you know, saying, well, yeah, you're coming to see me to, to just to have a chat. And as long as we're open with that, then we've got to, we still maintain that therapeutic relationship in a very positive way, rather than going, well, wait a minute, who needs who here? You know, is it that I'm, I'm needing you to pay my mortgage? Now, now that's, that's, not a, that's not a good relationship. That's not a, a professional relationship. Um, so, so maintaining that kind of openness of why somebody is coming in is, I think, is hopefully a really useful thing um, for everybody. Um, new or old at this <laughs> definitely great points um a few little comments coming through here john w said i have 40 year olds believe it's part of getting old never mind 70 yeah 
people have all got different experiences and they've read different stuff they believe they've got family members so yeah plenty of 40 year olds think yeah oh, my knees are hurting because i'm 40. it's wear and tear you know just put up with it sarah fluid as well says uh john w me too crazy gary benson <laughs> comes in here founded the sda my 81 year old mother cuts nearly two acres of grass with a push mower i keep telling her i'm doing her a favor I'm not sure if that's an old Les Dawson joke or it's actually true, Gary Benson. But yeah, but, but that's true. Yeah, yeah. Allow your um, your elderly relatives, as long as it's, they're not in pain, to move. Encourage them to move around. Nikki Mansfield says, dun, 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 dun. "I love what Owen says about showing them showing them in their body to really challenge their story." Very nice. Um, Tracy Marsh is coming here. My 90 year old father plays golf twice a week and took up table tennis in his 80s. Age is definitely not a barrier. Excellent. Good. Um, and then Nikki Mansfield has come back here again with can we hear some stuff about the core? Thank you, Nikki. Actually, yeah, it's a good point. Um, let's fast forward because um, one of these other points, the 10, and just in case you started halfway through the podcast, we're commenting on a 2020 editorial that came out in BJSM, um, which was called um, Back to Basics, 10 Facts Every Person Should Know About Back Pain. Um, number four, we've kind of commented on scans really show the cause of back pain. We talked about the, the limitations of MRIs when we've got perfectly healthy, asymptomatic 35, 40 year olds with all sorts of um, weird degeneration going on and, and um, label tears and bulging discs and, and they're asymptomatic. You know, there's some amazing studies showing that. So you mustn't jump. And it's even worse if the patient sees it. We tell them that because that could open up a whole can of worms. So we don't number four. Five is pain with exercise and movement doesn't mean you're doing harm. OK, but I'm going to scoot down. Thanks to Nikki Mansfield. I'm going to scoot down to what was actually. Da, 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 yeah, number seven, because this links in nicely with you, um, Mr. Owen Lewis. It is back pain is not caused by a weak core. Now, I didn't realize, but you've you've had a bit of a gender for a year, haven't you, with regards to the core? Yeah, I have rather. Um, yeah, a year or so ago. No, under a year now. But um, I was asked to uh, write a little book on on the core. And um, stupidly, I thought, well, you know, I'm not too busy, <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll, I'll give it a go. How hard can writing be? And what an easy topic to start start that with. <laughs> so I jumped into that minefield um, of, of the core. And it was, yeah, as with everything, you, you know, you start to dig into something, you start to scratch and scrape into, into, into a subject. And, and the subject of the core is, you know, has fascinated me. Thankfully, um, I realized how little I knew. Um, and actually, I instead of panicking at that point, I went, oh, phew, because when I'm in clinic, I, I always start with that place of I know I know nothing. Uh, I, I, somebody walks in. I don't know anything about them. OK, let, let's find out. You know, I know about anatomy, but that's not them. So let, let's start to find out. And, this, and the same sort of process is kind of gone through within um, trying to understand this this concept of the core. And of course, really, the, the idea of the core is is a is a myth. You know, we, we don't have some anatomy that sits down the center of us like an apple core that sits there as the sort of strong pillar. What we're really often talking about in the core is actually more of the kind of equator. <laughs> it's those outer structures that give us the support so it's a, it's a strange um word and a strange concept but one of which really leads or led me certainly down down a, a, a way down a route sorry um and i really wanted to to acknowledge the kind of common um idea of core uh, which is gonna it's not gonna change it's gonna be out there forever i think um it's it's too strong um, a, a concept. Um, you know, we talk about you know core concepts and core perceptions and core this, that, and the other. It, it, it's so in our language. Um, I also wanted to challenge it a little bit. I want to extend some of our understanding and then start to use it in a, in a kind of practical um, practical way. So that's that's really kind of the the premise of the book um, that um, that I've cobbled together. Um, 
it does, um, I think, <laughs> hopefully wisely, um, avoid uh, a certain definition. Because one of the things about the core is that it's not certain. It is actually a fluid element, as we are. We are, you know, we are um, bags of water. So that idea of the core being a solid structure that needs stability, you know, the core stability kind of mantra with, with, um, or the core stability kind of um, um, cult really, with the mantra being the transversus abdominis um, idea is one that, um, yeah, really needs a little bit of a, little bit of a nudge, a little bit of a challenge, I think. Um, and, and, you know, we talk about stability and again, stability is something that is contextual. It's something that's unstable. It's changing all the time. And, and again, stability, even in the engineering literature that I trawled through with much smoke coming out of my ears, there was no definition of stability. You know, there really isn't a definition, a solid definition of stability. So we have, there's no definition, solid definition of stability. There's no solid agreed definition of core. So now we've got these two flux places, which for me was like a great relief because it meant that we could start to say, oh yeah, well actually this area of core stability and having a solid core is a myth because it's based on fluidity and movement. So now we can start to develop those ideas. And, and that's kind of what I've, what I've tried to do. Um, so the idea that the, you know, the weak core um, um, might cause lower back pain, well, again, we've got no evidence to suggest or, 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 to, or to support that kind of an idea. Yeah. And actually, what often has happened, of course, is that we've We've gone down that bracing route. We've gone down the strength element. We've gone down the solid, stable place. And what has happened for, unfortunately, lots of people is that those muscles have been switched on over a long period of time. If they're switched on for a long period of time, they're going to ache. They're going to be fatigued. They're not going to function so well. And they're likely within the low back, to bring it back to that, to compress that system. And we know that as soon as that system's compressed, that's much more likely to cause dysfunction, lack of movement, and potentially pain. So we're in a really interesting little cycle there, I think. Um, so, so really that kind of stiff spine, we gotta move away from and say, well, actually, can we have a more fluid flowing mobile spine that is strong? And then we say, well, what do we mean by strong? And to me, again, I have to spin into the sort of Zen philosophies of, of strength and say, well, actually, you know, there's that lovely story. I'm sure everyone's heard of it. The wind's blowing hard and the, the strong um, oak tree, you know, is, is there. It's, it's battering against the wind and the poor little piece of grass just blows over. And the oak tree, after a while, is laughing at the piece of grass, but then it crashes down, it snaps. And of course the wind dies and the piece of grass just bends back up. And we say, well, which one's strong? And ultimately we'd like a bit of both for us. We'd like that combination of switching those muscles on, but crucially also uh, switching them off and letting us relax, letting us slump, letting us go into so-called bad postures, whatever that is, and, um, and, and, and really uh, allow the core, allow the whole body to uh, operate and function as as beautifully as it as it actually can does that get it <laughs> oh that's definitely hit the spot yeah very nice when the analogy of the of the of the oak tree and the blade of glass just yeah that sealed it off wonderfully now that's great i love a good analogy yeah marvelous information really nice and something again you can use with a patient it's nice to use their own metaphors but have a few under your belt just to which you know kind of often hit the spot it's really nice yeah great great stuff and i love the way that you described it as a as a journey of just thinking and critically analyzing your own beliefs and then just coming to the natural conclusion you know maybe to, 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 to the idea that bracing is actually going to create um, tension and therefore potentially pain as opposed just to learning how to let go and move and flow yeah really nice stuff absolutely and one of the things we sort of i i, I touch in in there is is the the fashion of the corset yeah and um, in all the masses of research on the transversus abdominis, they often talk about the transversus being a corset-like structure. So 
I went, okay, well, what's a corset? And I started uh, looking to, into corsetry. Um, it was quite bizarre. Um, long nights, long yeah, winter nights. I had to explain it to my wife a little bit before I got started buying those books and things. Um, but I didn't realize how, quite how, um, you know, how much they crushed the ribs and, and, and twisted the internal organs and, and, um, and reduced the lung capacity. I understood what well, I understood. I, I'd heard a lot about the women, you know, the oppression of the women uh, as a result of that, that wearing that corset. And I started to think, well, is the core the new corset? Does it have that capacity? And I think absolutely it does. You know, you see on in the Hollywood uh, blockbusters, you always see the men with their six pack. You never see the women with their six packs, um, but you can imagine. And you have a particular waist, a particular look for the man versus the women. Uh, and it, you know, it's, it's endemic in our in our society. And um, and again, I think it's just something that's well, it certainly made me smile and go and, and look up a little bit. And go, oh, okay, this is this is interesting that it's um, it's kind of still there, just in a slightly different variation. Yeah, definitely. And um, I guess I know you work quite a lot with with evolved Pilates teachers and things because like traditional Pilates or what they thought at the time was contemporary Pilates was actually kind of reinforcing that idea because we should mention that at the time, like when Paul Hodges came out with the Transversal Dominus paper, it was revolutionary. It was amazing. It was a yeah. lovely idea. But even he, I can't remember what year it was now, but even he later on kind of went, well, actually thinking about it, it's not quite as significant as we thought because blah, blah, blah. But by then it was too late. The DVDs were out, the T-shirts were printed and there was these whole schools kind of teaching this and people caught up with it. That happens so much, doesn't it? A great person comes out with an idea um, and hopefully will be there as well. In 10 years' time, they'll be laughing at what we're saying now, maybe. Yeah. Um, but, um, yeah, people get carried away with it. So to, to people out there listening, if you are still getting your clients to lie down because you've done a Scott or Stop Pilates course and they're telling you to imagine you've got a bit of string, pulling your belly button in and all that sort of stuff, there may be a time and a place for this, which really helps. But to evolve, yeah, you need to get away from that idea. I love the idea of a corset. You know, do, is that how you want to be the whole time with a really tight corset done up around your waist to protect you? It's another great analogy. Good stuff. So people on your courses, for example, I imagine that your course is a pretty friendly place for people to come along and be and challenge themselves and, and gently kind of tweak what they're doing. Because you're not saying give up Pilates at all. You're not saying stop doing these exercises yeah. because you wouldn't you wouldn't survive, would you? But yeah, is that well, part of the idea on your courses? Well, I, I think, you know, they, the, yeah, there is no such thing as a bad exercise. The question is, is it the right exercise, the right movement, the right whatever for that particular individual and for that particular task? Uh, and, and as soon as we get that precise and that specific, um, then we're on a winner because then we're starting to talk about their motor program, not the generic motor program, because we know the motor control is is absolutely individual, individually specific. So to turn around and say that is the perfect exercise for everybody is as crazy as saying that is the terrible exercise for everybody. You know, they're in the same kind of camp. And we say, well, actually, that we, let's tailor this. Let's tweak it. Let's change it. Um, and yeah, the workshops, I mean, you know, like you say, I think like that word gentle, you know, I, I, I don't think it's, my my work, um, and, uh, and I think I'll speak for James to say, it's not challenging. You know, we're not going to turn around and say you're wrong. You know, be aggressively challenging. We are going to ask the question why, and pose some some other alternatives. But we definitely don't want to throw out the years and uh, of experience and and, and skill sets that that people already have and, and have gained over the years. Um, I want to build on. On, on that, um, rather than rather than take it away. No, we will be will be much uh, weaker for that. All of us. Let's let's build on it, and and part of that is asking that that all all important question of why. Very nice. When out of interest is this book going to be um, available? With a bit of luck, and and publishers doing whatever the publishers do, uh, be end of the year. Um, this year, maybe into next, but somewhere around the end of this year, hopefully. Decided on a title yet? Um, yes, 
But it's if it, I don't... My hesitation just because it was yesterday was we kind of put the green light to the title of Beyond Core. Beyond Core, nice. So hopefully everyone will go, that sounds brilliant because finding a title core. actually one of the hardest parts of um, parts. Yeah, tricky, yeah, very tricky. Um, wonderful, no, it sounds good. It's, it's, it's going to be a, um, a, yeah, a great source of information for people. Um, I'm conscious of the time, just in case people are wondering what some of the other points on there was. It's kind of linked in. Um, there is an important point, which kind of uh, number 10, in fact, it was injection, surgery, and strong drugs usually aren't a cure, um, which gets on the whole another topic of opioids. and and. But it's kind of the same as going over the top with core exercises. They might help at the right time, but if it, it should just be a crutch to get you through a certain stage or day. But if you're doing it the whole time, then that's not going to be a solution, is it? No, sure. No, we, we, we need a, a, a bigger picture. We need to really focus on where is that cause coming from? You know, is it the TV in that silly example I gave? Um, it, that could be the cause. And, and we, we've got to find that out through, through decent questioning. Um, or is it the, the twist in the foot that's spinning up into the back? Or you know, it, can, it literally can be anywhere. You know, we, consensus of the evidence is absolutely that be clear that that it can be from anywhere. It doesn't even have to be an adjacent um, structure. So we're not talking the lower back to the you know ribs to the um, pelvis. We're talking lower back to foot, lower back to neck, to shoulder, to you name it. TV. <laughs> How do you? I'm, I'm thinking because posture is still taught very much on level three, level four kind of sports massage, sports massage therapy courses as being the way to to solve the problem for your patient. You do posture analysis, look for symmetry and that sort of stuff. I know you've spoken out wonderfully kind of to try and redefine what we think about posture, but what would you say to somebody who still believes that like someone comes into their clinic with lower back pain, they're going to do a postural check and they see the pelvis is this position, they think, ah, oh, that's what's causing your pain. How do you help that person move on from the idea that pain is caused by poor posture? Well, first of all, we need to understand what poor posture is. And if, again, if you can define what good or bad posture is, you're doing better than any research that's out there. There is no definition of poor posture. There's no definition of, of bad posture. We don't agree with that because everyone's posture is slightly different. We can't definitely say that's good and that's bad because as soon as we say good and bad posture, that's a moral um, question of good and bad. So we're into morality. And actually, as soon as we talk about posture, posture is a morality question. It's a question of, you know, sit up straight, behave yourself, you know, have good morals. Um, don't be like um, Richard III with that kind of mountain on his back. That was Shakespeare's sort of, you know, um, idea. You know, that, 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 that's poor morals. That's poor posture. That's about as close as we get. Now, this is not a discussion of anatomy, biomechanics, pain, all of what we've talked about. So this idea of posture is, is really fraught with, with major problems. Um, and we know that posture and pain are not linked. Yeah, there, there just isn't a link that we can find between somebody who has perceived good posture and perceived bad posture. And actually, there's plenty of evidence out there that says, Somebody who perceives somebody with bad posture may have no pain. Yeah? And somebody with good posture might be in pain because they're holding themselves in a very stiff, not moving, unfunctional. Oh, okay, so now we're talking about movement. We're not talking about a solid, certain position because we're not solid and certain. So it's actually, it's a, it's a relatively easy challenge to make behind that, that, that potential barrier of sitting correctly or standing correctly yeah now if you're talking about postural assessment we've got to realize that if we're talking about that we're talking more about alignment and yeah? our alignments are slightly different there's less morality to that discussion and i think then we're talking more about you know is that a particular joint aligned is the head of the femur sitting in the acetabulum yeah? or is it sliding forwards every time they you know um, they sit down and they go into a squat 
Well, if it's sliding forwards every time, no wonder you've got that anterior labral tear or that discomfort. So wait a minute, well, why is it pushing forwards? And we're into whys. We're talking about alignment, we're talking about movement, biomechanics, and we're saying why? Why is it pushing forwards? Is it because there's something happening at the hip? Or is it just as likely because it's being spun, pushed, whatever you want to call it, from a deficit below in the foot, or some twist and turn up in the cranium, you know, or the neck, or somewhere else that's causing a twist that's counter to the, and the hip is just the reactor to the actor of somewhere else. Now, that's a very different discussion to saying, if you stand correctly, everything will be fine. That's not, that's not a truth. So well put. I love the idea of posture being a moral question of, yeah, it's so true, isn't it? Sit up, put yourself straight, you're looking, you're looking unkempt. Yeah, really nice idea. And even putting a bit of Shakespeare in there. Marvellous. Look at this. Um, 902, people. Now, I know I don't want to keep you waiting. Um, but just to, again, if people are interested, we have been working through, um, just in case you're, you're not familiar, 2020 paper in the British Journey of Sports Medicine, Back to Basics, 10 Facts Every Person Should Know About Back Pain. Um, that's something I'll put the link in the show notes, but um, giving his um, thoughts on each of those 10 points, um, or the six we've kind of got through, has been Owen Lewis, co-founder of Born to Move Education Providers. So if you like what you have heard, and uh, you're keen to um, go down um, the idea of having a little bit of CPD or education with Born to Move. And let me just bring up a website. I just quickly want you to kind of give us an idea of what the different courses um, you've got there, uh, actually how they differ and, and what people might want to choose. If you go to the website, which is borntomove.com and click on courses, you can see you've got um, quite a lot of different options there. How, do they, how are they differentiated? What's the idea there? Yeah, so, um, so first of all, I mean, there is no particular order to them. Um, you know, you, you can um, go to whichever one happens to be nearest to you. We've got various venues around around the world, actually, but certainly around um, the UK um, that we're offering uh, in different places. So we've got Born to Walk, which is very much based on um, on James's um, book. Um, so I don't want to go too much into that. Um, but you can imagine very much into gait, gait analysis and understanding um, everything to do with, um, with that um, based on his book and, and really taking that into a kind of practical approach. Then we've got um, the functional body work um, workshop, which is very much about saying, well, instead of getting people always on the couch and working that way, what if we could stand them up, get them moving and work with them and with their tissue, with their uh, motor program, their, their control, um, and, and the way that they move whilst they're moving. What, a, what an amazing tool that would be. So that's the tool that we offer within the functional bodywork um, um, uh, uh, workshop. And then the, the third of those um, major workshops that we offer is the uh, functional assessment. And functional assessment is uh, the workshop where we are trying to find out where's the cause and where is it best for us to intervene. Yeah? So if someone has lower back pain, is it coming from their foot? Is it coming from their lower back? Is it coming from their shoulder? If I know that it's coming from their shoulder, then I know where to intervene to get the biggest change. So that's really what we're, what we're trying to get to within the um, functional assessment piece is something that is uh, I've developed with um, the uh, having studied uh, long and hard with uh, Diane Lee, a brilliant physiotherapist from uh, from Canada. Um, we've also got other courses that are, and, and workshops that are happening. Uh, particularly exciting um, this year is a series of um, shorter um, day events um, in St Ives, where. We are, are doing some incredibly new and, and innovative kind of taster courses, um, lectures, um, one of which um, I'll be doing, one of which James will doing. And also we've got a really nice collaboration between the two of us. So we'll both be there, which doesn't happen that much. And um, I'm already really excited about that one because, um, you know, we, me and James have, have been spinning ideas about, well, we could go down this route, we could do this way. 
and 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 we've come up with a with a really interesting kind of combination of of of, um, of, of an approach to 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 show off a little bit some of the skill sets that that we can offer in those longer courses. Sounds amazing, and all those details are available on bornsmove.com. And there's online courses as well for people who don't want to travel as well. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. So there's um, some online courses. Some uh, and and again, some of those are being developed as kind of almost as we speak. Um, so there's more online courses happening on there, but there are some on there already. And there's also um, James's books and um, soon my own. Soon your own. That sounds amazing. That's good, um, and I appreciate those those long weekends you've had trying on corsets and looking at core <laughs> engines and stuff. It's amazing. <laughs> The images in my head i need to delete Sorry. very quickly marvelous well thank you so much um, and if people want to follow you i mean born to move is underscore born to move on instagram and twitter um and then on facebook you've got the born to move uh, it's actually born to move my fashion which is up there on facebook uh, they're the main places for people to follow and get involved as well as the website yes absolutely and thank you for remembering which they were because uh, all... <laughs> that's okay i can I <laughs> um so yeah so that's how people can get in contact with you um and follow you so so there we go that zoomed by that hour um don't go away owen i'll just say thank you to you once i've shut down the live lounge but thank you to everybody who's joined us apologies for some of the uh comments that i didn't get time to bring up john w says great differentiation between posture mole where you stand on something and alignment is a structural issue love it says james fantastic and there's some nice conversations going on there thank you nikki for, for stepping in and uh saying where uh the quote came from that john w was after what was that interesting let's see nikki said i oh, know it was uh I think it was to do with the stability quote you asked about. Where is it? John. Da, 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 da. Oh, yeah. It was John Novak, was it? John Novak. Cooperation is intrinsically unstable. Stabilization requires a persistent activity, fluctuations in muscle activity. Stability requires the unstable sway. Very nice. Thank you, Nikki, for jumping in there with your fantastic brain capacity for remembering where quotes came from. Thank you. Appreciate it. Right, people. So thank you very much. Thank you for joining us uh, live, people in the live lounge. Thank you for listening to this podcast. If you are listening to the podcast um, and you would like to join us live, then just uh, pop to the Sports Therapy Association YouTube channel at eight o'clock on, on, on a Tuesday. Um, if you can't do that and you've enjoyed the podcast, then do please uh, leave a review and a rating. It just helps us appear higher in the Google search. So if someone does put in core rather than getting some outdated narrative from 1990, they will see Owen Lewis up there at the Sports Therapy Association or Born to Move. But it only happens if you leave ratings and reviews. So we appear higher. So if you could do that, that would be amazing. If you're on an iPhone, it should take you 10, 20 seconds just on your own innate nap. Android users, like I said before, I think you have to go to your back garden and do twirls and slap a kip on your bare buttocks or something for a while to get a review on Apple Podcasts. It's a little bit more confusing. But if you can take the time to do that, that'd be really nice as well. We will be back next week for part two of um, Focus on the Lower Back. Not sure who the guest is. I'm still trying to work that out, but we will be here. So if you can join us live, that'd be wonderful. So all that's left for me to do is say once again, thank you to Owen Lewis of Born to Move. Thank you very much. Thank you. And hopefully we'll see some of you next week on the Sports Therapy Association podcast. Take care.